All right, recording, people watching the recorded view, we're starting the recording, and I am going live on Facebook right now, so take us a minute to get to the right spot. There we go. Right. International Women's Day by recognizing women who paved the way for us. Okay. Hi everybody, this is Tierra International and uh, I think I need to sh shut the other live broadcast screen so we don't get that little annoying screeching sound. But um, uh, we're here, Tierra International. We're here on International Women's Day Facebook live broadcast. Just coincidentally, we go live on Fridays and this Friday is International Women's Day. So we're excited to be here for that. I'm, I'm Betsy Sobiak, for those of you who are just tuning in for the first time, one of the global leaders for Tierra. And with me, we have the Chicago area contingent, um, Beth Rusky. Hello, everybody. And Peg Rowe. Hi there. And we are uh, excited today. So we were contemplating what do we do on International Women's Day um, because we know there's so much now uh, out there that's being posted and shared all around the world, which is awesome. I know that the US was a little late in the game that they started more in the European side um, where they were really acknowledging what women had to do to really have the opportunity to work and to vote and to contribute at the same level as male counterparts and, and some of the hardship endured during the, the start of that. So um, luckily we, Celebrate it everywhere now as a moment to stop and reflect. And we thought that what we would do, the three of us on this particular uh, Facebook Live, is we would actually just research a little bit. So these aren't necessarily the stories that were just right there on the top of our minds, but research a little bit and find a couple of stories that we wanted to share with you about women from the past who really paved the way for the opportunities we have today. And for each of us, personally. So whatever we consider to be a priority in the lives that we've led ourselves, um, we just took a glance back to see who were some of the people that did the heavy lifting the first time, the pioneers, to make it possible and give a little bit of recognition to them. And for those of you listening, whether you're listening on Facebook Live now, thank you, or tuning into our uh, recording afterward, take this as an opportunity to do the same, to think, okay, for the things that I do now, the things that are important to me, who did it first? Who created that opportunity? Whether it's male or female or recent history or a long time ago. And it's interesting to just kind of connect those dots. So we've all chosen a few. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just gonna go around, maybe just like go around a couple of times and just share some yeah. of our stories that we found and, and go from there. So Peg, why don't I start with you? I think you have the most, so we're going to probably. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to do all of them either, but right. yeah. Yeah. So you want to pull up the suffragettes if we did this, you know, in terms of what feels like it's super impactful. Um, I was interested because Susan B. Anthony is often given sort of claim for being the leader of the suffragette. Um, oh, there we go. Well, now we have the champagne one up. Um, the suffragette movement. Um, and what's interesting for me, because I have this timeline sort of idea in my head that the, the suffragette movement began in 1869, and there were actually you know, three different women who participated in that, in addition to Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And they had two separate organizations that merged together in like 1890. 
the thing that's important for me is that I, that was really a bold move for those women. I mean, those women did not have really any rights. Their rights were all a function of their husbands and what their husbands could do. And it took until 1920 for the 19th Amendment to be ratified. And that's a heck of a long time. I mean, you know, for, for that effort to have begun basically in the mid to sort of later um, version of 1800s and take till early 1920 so that women secured the right to vote. And I, and I know for me, I don't take it for granted. And then once I had the ability to vote, I have voted in every possible election. I voted absentee. I am really committed as a voter. I just think it's one of the most important rights that we have. And I am forever grateful to those women for having banded together and fought the good fight so that we have that privilege. Yeah, and when I think about it, that's also such a long time to sustain yes. the battle. Yes. Right? Like you think, oh yeah. yeah, they did that, good for them. But when you yeah. give the states, I mean, what is that, 40 yeah. or 50 years? It's that crazy, yes, that it took that long, uh-huh. Yeah, and that's what was amazing for me. It's like, you know, because I have a sense of I want some things to happen faster now and people get and we all get frustrated by that. We all feel like, oh, my gosh, this, you know, evolutionary thing is so long and it takes so long. Um, and I wish it didn't take so long. But then when I look back at this movement, it's like, wow, that took a tremendous amount of concerted effort to get us to that point. Yeah. You know, Peg, the other thing that I love about this um, story, I, uh, I personally do not love that it took 50 years. No. It's <laughs> logical. But yes. um, I love that it required more than just women. You know, yes. it's one of those things that, yeah. you know, their husbands, their fathers, their, you know, brothers, their friends had to realize that this actually makes sense. And um, so that's the bittersweet for me because it's so lovely. And yet at the same time, it's like 50 years, people, please. Yes, you know. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. And when you, well, when you think about it, it's like who ratified the 19th Amendment? It was men who ratified the 19th Amendment. Women were represented there. I mean, that, that in and of itself is pretty astounding. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, and I was going to build on that to pull up one of my stories, which is um, the mother of Title IX, Patsy Mink, because again, obviously look at this picture, right? There's yeah. a lot at the table as well. So that's another one that took a, a lot of partnership yeah. to articulate. And there are some things that are misunderstood about Title IX, like it actually is more than just sports. It yeah. is a lot of different ways that um, uh, uh, girls would have equal educational opportunities and the things that were outside of academics and included like 10 different things. Mm -hmm. um, I know that for myself, uh, being a, a high school athlete, it was really important to have those opportunities. Like I yeah. think it's like, you know, literally game changing as far as my confidence, my ability to right. get to know people, um, social circles, like the whole thing. And without having that capability, I think yeah. my whole high school experience, because I went to um, a few different high schools because my family moved. And if I didn't have volleyball as like the thing that I did to enter, you know, the three different high schools I went to, it would have been so much harder. So Plus, it's just an awesome character building opportunity. And Patsy Mink is the one who actually wrote it. It also was written um, in the year I was born, 1972. So I think that. Oh, wow. Is, that's cool. exactly, the, the thing I love about that is that um, I had no idea that Patsy Mink, who you know is an Asian American woman, was the one yeah. who, who actually, yeah. you know, was the author of that. Now, I do know that it stood for more than just sports, you know, but it gets its it's its representation in, in, and talked a lot about in sports. Yeah. But, you know, today, I think academically, it is probably one of the places where we do have the most parity in the United States. Mm -hmm. We have more women going into college now than men. Right. We also have more women graduating than men and also more women coming out with advanced degrees than men. So yeah. gender parity has absolutely, um, yes. you know, there. Now, in terms of professors and Board of Governors and all that? No, not so much. But in terms of the student body, I think we're seeing that. And that was a huge, huge shift. Yeah, I don't think say in this article that they ended up renaming it officially the Patsy T. Mink Equal Opportunity Education Act after she passed away in 2002. And she is the first Asian American woman and woman of color to serve on the United States Congress. Um, and she wow. basketball from her native uh, state of Hawaii for Maui High School, but was never allowed to play full court 
because it was believed that it was going to be too stressful on girls yeah. to have to run up and down the whole basketball court. I know. I, the story is very interesting. This is a great article here. The yeah. Basketball. That is insane to me as somebody who did play basketball and taught yeah. basketball, but that was how my mother, my mother had a charm that, you know, my mother wasn't sports oriented at all, but she had a charm and it was a basketball charm. And I remember asking her like, what was this from? She's like, well, I played basketball. I'm like, you did? <laughs> yeah. And then she described there were, you know, there were three people on a side and there were three mm -hmm. people on defense and three on offense and they didn't cross the court. And that was because as you're pointing out, they were, it was just too much running. It was just too, right. too, too stressful. Too delicate. There was too delicate women. Yes. You know, yes. and then I think about how I coach girls at that age today. And I'm like, Hey, if you know, who cares, you know, get up, run, you know, I'm like, yeah. let's yeah. go. you know, so yeah. it's just so different. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's a great yeah. one. Yeah. What about one of yours? Um, I'm going to start with uh, Joanne Woodward, who was uh, a, a wonderful actress. She was uh, well known for Three Faces of Eve, which was a, a huge breakout performance mm -hmm. for her. Mm -hmm. um, she was she was an actress for over six decades. Um, and uh, so this is her later in life. Uh, she was stunningly beautiful. She was really smart. And she was married to Paul Newman for over 50 years, from 1958 until his death uh, in 2008. And they raised a family. They were one of the first Hollywood couples that said, screw Hollywood. Like, we're going to live our life as we want to live our life. Yes. And so they really formed a great partnership together. They both had huge careers that they were both, you know, very, very, um, um, they were the top celebrities of their days for sure. And she was the first woman to get a, um, a star on the walk of fame in Hollywood. I didn't know that. Wow. That in 1960, she was the very first female star to get a, a walk of fame. And the other thing that I really admire about her and Paul Newman as well is they are, they were huge philanthropists mm -hmm. um, throughout their entire lives. So, you know, they had, uh, he had daughters, he had some children from a previous marriage, but she had, uh, together they had three daughters. She calls herself a doting grandmother. Um, and she also, um, she and Paul have done a couple of really important um, charitable foundations. The first one was the Hole in the Wall game, which was for children uh, and families that are, um, you know, surviving cancer and, you know, coping with cancer for them to come and be at camp in a regular setting. So no, you know, I mean, to just let them be yeah. kids yeah. and have their families experience that. So that was one of their uh, joint ones. And then, of course, uh, Paul Newman's, you know, charitable um, uh, program and, and all of his proceeds go to uh, charitable organizations. So that's not its own charitable organization. They fund existing organizations already. Mm -hmm. And that second organization, the, the, the first hole in the wall, had over so far over 20,000 children experience wow. um, camp. And then the um, uh, Paul Newman, you know, I forget that it's, I think it's just the... Um, Newman's own? Newman's own, own. yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, Newman's own over a half a billion dollars. Yeah. So a hundred percent of the profits go to, you know, the charitable distribution. And the funny thing is when they were, it started with his, uh, Paul Newman's um, uh, salad dressing. Right. You know, he like loved to make it. And, you know, like Joanne, you know, teased him one day and said, you should go into, you know, you should sell this. And so he and a friend of his, you know, thought about that. And so they were trying to do that. And when they said, you have to, you're not going to be able to break into this market unless you put your face on the bottle and give Paul Newman credit. He says, well, if I had put my face on the bottle, then I'm going to give it all away. And so, so they decided to do that. So between the two of them, I mean, they've just had such an impact on uh, the world and really live in life their way. And I love that. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. That's a great one. Yeah. And what I also love is, they had that long sustained marriage when that was not the thing in Hollywood. I mean, people went through multiple wives and, and husbands in the courses of their lives. And for them to be, you know, in this, have two high powered careers and children and, you know, remain committed to one another for all that time um, in an environment that didn't always support that. I think that's also so admirable. 
Yeah. There's a picture on the screen there of Joanne in a um, cap and gown. And Paul, right. he was hired to be the commencement speaker. Um, and it, she was getting her degree the same time her, her, uh, one of her daughters were. And Paul Newman was interviewed because he was the commencement speaker. And he said, one of the women came up to him and said, how dare you have your career riding on the coattails of your wife? <laughs> <laughs> and he was so great. He was so funny about it. He's like, I know, right? Like, how lucky am I? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, again, this is another story where when we're celebrating International Women's Day, it's not about only women. It's about yeah. obviously women being supported by their spouses, their children, mm -hmm. their schools, the, the co-workers or colleagues. Yet it still is, uh, took something extra to do something different um, as a woman in the time period that they were living, you know, so I'm very struck by uh, that it really is like a collective support and partnership that did cause for these breakthroughs, but it still took a woman saying like, you know what, even though it's not the norm, I'm going to do this thing my way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Peg, what's another one of yours? Let's do Billie Jean King. Okie doke. <laughs> and yeah. Oh, wow. Um, and the thing that I admire about Billie Jean King is that she fought and was successful in creating pay equity in the professional tennis world. And that was one of the most visible places for it. Um, and we still don't, uh, across the board, we don't have pay equity, but she really, really went out on a limb um, and refused to pay, play in tournaments where men and women were not being paid the same and really sort of put herself and her reputation on the line and was really willing to put herself out there and I think it's pretty extraordinary that, you know, someone at that time would take such a bold move to really fight for pay equity for all women. And by doing that, she made that example at, uh, in a way that, that made it then okay for other women to talk about that and, and begin to demand the same thing in whatever profession they were in. And again, we're not there yet. That's one of those that where we really bemoan the fact that it feels like it's going to take forever and a darn day to get there. But I think it's women like Billie Jean King who are willing to, to really go out on a limb to make that point that makes it easier for us to be in that conversation today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think um, there's also, Peg, um, you know, you talk about uh, pay equity. You know, we've seen in the United States the women's U.S. soccer uh, team actually be a bit on strike, so to speak, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of that. They've been criticized yeah. severely, you know. Yeah which is unfortunate <laughs> because they're actually, they've achieved way more acclaim than the men. Yeah, exactly. Men. And yes. they're being way blessed. I mean, it's just, yeah. that, you know, and that, that's the thing I've always thought about sports. I thought sports was kind of a great equalizer on some yes. level because yes. it is a bit transactional. Like you can actually measure somebody's success and it's, it's night and day. I mean, it's just, it's so clear. It's yes or no. And then, um, and then most recently, it occurred again in the U.S. hockey. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, the U.S. women who won gold, and there were two twins on the team, um, and, and they were, they've actually put their brand behind the U.S. hockey equity, you know, equity pay, you know, it's like, yeah. now there's, the men clearly have more medals, more recognition. Right. But their message was, we're working just as hard. We're actually, right. bringing, we were on yeah. just as many late nights as they were. Like we were right. bringing the networks just as much ratings. Right. How yeah. can it not be equal? Exactly. Exactly. And I think, again, these, these examples and the women who are willing to go out on a limb uh, to make that example actually pave the way for others who don't have that that notoriety or that publicity or the ability to garner that kind of attention and make it okay for 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 women to, to make to be in that conversation. Yeah, yeah. And make that request. Um, Peg, why don't you do one more? Okay, let me let's do Madame Clicquot. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Madame Clicquot um, headed up the. Uh, Champagne House of Clicquot after her husband died and she was only 27 years old. 
Um, and she revolutionized the making of sparkling wines. Um, just very quickly, you make sparkling wines by, and to some degree, you, you, you put yeast into regular wine and it creates the bubbles it, as it does its little magic. And that's how we get that sparkling wine. That's a very simplified version of it. But what would happen is you'd have all this nasty sediment at the bottom which nobody wanted. And so she was the one who at Buclico invented this way of turn the bottle on their sides, rotating them so that the yeast would fall to the neck, and then they would take that off, pull the yeast plug out um, after they froze it, and then re and rebottle it. And that's the way sparkling wine is made to this day. And you know, part of the reason that I was attracted to this story is that Buclico is actually my favorite champagne. I was introduced to it by a friend many years ago, and it's always been my favorite champagne, bar none. And so I was just fascinated that this young woman, and at that time, women basically didn't own businesses right. unless they inherited them from their husband. If their husband died or their father gave it to them, they didn't often have businesses on their own. So for her to be 27 and to step in, and run this very successful winery um, at that young age was pretty extraordinary in that time. So, you know, we all love Bukli, Bukuko, and if we had a, a, a glass here right now, we would toast her <laughs> for all that she has contributed to us. Um, but for me, this was just kind of a fun one, but it was also an interesting story that I had no idea that there was a woman at the helm um, that really helped her create the success of this particular um, champagne company. It's awesome. It's awesome. So another one of mine. So I actually, as I was doing my research, I just put in first woman entrepreneur because <laughs> what wow. I'm really thankful of is um, being able to be a business owner. You know, I know that's not something that I take for granted. Not everybody has the opportunity to do that. And um, it's also not an easy path. It's not one that's like laid out for you. No one really knows what they're doing, yeah. especially at the beginning. And you rarely know, like, you know what you're doing even 10 to 15 years in. <laughs> but uh, so when I put in first female entrepreneur, this woman, um, Madame C.J. Walker, popped up. Um, so 1867 to 1919, so also, again, the late 1800s. Um, she was born Sarah Breedlove, and she specialized in hair products because she was solving a problem that she had with her hair. And then she ended up creating this whole business and was one of the most successful entrepreneurs of her time. Um, and here you can see in the story that it was a scalp yeah. with her own hair loss and she would travel around and she ended up manufacturing cosmetics and training salespeople and the whole thing. Um, she did come from a background in slavery. So she also uh, transcended that history and then created this whole business that was highly successful across the country. And you can see here that she's known as entrepreneur, civil rights activist, and philanthropist. So to your point, Beth, even with the, like the Newmans mm -hmm. and Joanne Woodward, it's yeah. like then she also continually gave back. And her quick facts here, you can see that um, she was the first American woman to become a self-made millionaire. Wow, that's impressive. Nice. It really was. And in 1913, she donated the largest amount of money by an African American toward the Indianapolis YMCA. And she was also part of the delegation um, to make lynching a crime in 1917. Wow. So like active on all fronts. And one of the things we talk about with um, Tierra is also that as you grow in terms of doing what you know to do, solving the problems you know to solve and you expand in your influence, what do you do with that influence? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's so clear in this story that as she grew and created her own success, which was also solving a problem, for other people in the community, she then used that influence to continue to um, progress on civil rights and to give back and to create places for um, her community members, which is fantastic. Yeah. I love the, the connection, Betsy, with the influence because that's what I was noticing with uh, the, the women that I chose and I'm seeing in the thread throughout all of these is, mm -hmm. you know, how did they use their influence? And, right. um, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to be a philan uh, you know, philanthropic mindset, but you know, if, if you're only doing it for you, I, I don't know very many people who are successful if it's so myopic, you know? And so it's, it's, it's really like giving it away and sharing in the power, sharing their influence, using it for good. 
Um, I, I, that's something I personally admire, you know, and I think I know it's something that we in Tierra, yeah. you know, really do a stri- you know, try to be. And so, um, yeah, I, I like the influence. This is definitely a story I want to look more into. Like as I read it, I, I think it should be a movie. I mean, maybe it is. I don't even yeah. really know. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'm going to look a little bit more in detail about her story too, if I have some time. But I loved um, finding her and discovering yeah. the story. And I do really feel like it's someone doing actions like that that made it possible for a lot of entrepreneurs, especially female entrepreneurs, to say, okay, mm-hmm. we can figure it out. We can solve a problem. We can make it into a business. We can support ourselves. We can give back. Right. Uh, very thankful for that. Mm-hmm. Well, you mentioned movie because the next one on uh, my list is Catherine Graham. And yes. um, she was the, the um, what, to prepare for this, well, of course, I being the shorthand person I am, I went to Wikipedia and said women first. <laughs> <laughs> and 20 pages later, you know, there you there's one first. But um, one of the things about her is that she actually was listed as the first woman publisher, but she wasn't. There was a woman in the 1800s and early 1900s out of Louisiana who was the first publisher, but she's listed as the first publisher. But she's the first female um, uh, publisher for the Washington Post, which back in its day was the heyday of of news and um it was a family business her father was very successful and um when her father passed away he gave he put his her husband in charge of the business not her and um she was not offended by that she she actually she said you know i was a woman of my time i knew i knew what i was i knew what i wasn't and i had no problem with that you know she's like i had a different way of going about and and providing influence she also said she didn't have a lot of confidence. She wasn't somebody, she said she didn't have a really powerful relationship with her mother, a strong relationship. She said her mom was very much the socialite. She was raised by nannies and, and um, you know, help. And she said that, um, she said she felt her mother undermining her confidence a lot throughout her life. Wow. So as she stood into positions of power, she said, I had to kind of like regrow myself into, you know, the woman that I became. She was also somebody who, um, she used mentors really well. She was very, very smart. Uh, Warren Buffett was one of her mentors. And so she, she did, she said, I didn't know too much about finance. So I called Warren Buffett, (laughs) you know, and so I mean, to me, that's just like brilliant, you know, like, so for a woman, yeah, like didn't have a lot of confidence. Okay. The other thing that was challenging for her was that her husband suffered from severe mental illness and depression. And so they had four children and, you know, she, she primarily, she, you know, she was the one responsible for them. But when her husband died, she then stepped into the role as publisher. Mm. And, um, and so it just kind of was like, if you think about it, you know, she was in a family business, expanded, 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 like her, I just had this vision of her, like, as a seed that just kept expanding and growing. And her, the Washington Post, of course, there was a movie in the last couple of years uh, with, uh, that was out about called The Post. Yeah. And it was, it was her, it was, it was her leadership that actually ran with the Watergate story that caused the resignation and the bringing to justice, uh, you know, all of those men that, you know, broke the law and the president himself, Nixon. Right. And, um, and she just, you know, she just did the right thing. So for a woman who said she wasn't a confident leader, you know, she just inspired some of the most crusty men around her, you know, to be part of the, um, the, the, you know, the vision that she had. And she also did recognize, and it was kind of a slow boil gender equity. So the post became early on, um, that was one of her banners, you know, gen- gender equity in any position, you know, and, um, and that was something that she promoted. So yeah. it's interesting in your story, it makes me think of just the times that um, all people, but women in particular, just step in to do the next thing there that they need to do. Like it's not necessarily planned out. Like here's my goal and here's where I want to end up. But it's like, okay, 
here's the next thing that needs to be yeah. done. I'm the best person to do it. And I'm going to step in. So when you said about the seed, like also blossoming, it just also sounds like it was like, okay, I'm just going to step up to the plate and get done what needs to get done. And I think that's a lot of women's stories where it's like, all right, I'm just going to do the thing that needs to be done next and put my lack of confidence or self-doubt aside because of the bigger picture and make it happen. When I think of the Watergate era and the really courageous decisions that she had to make that in light of the possible financial impact, if they were sued by the government, I mean, there's so many implications and her integrity just, you know, stood out in terms of making the right decision and being willing to put that risk aside and do the right thing. I, that, that's really quite extraordinary. And Peg, not even just financial and legal, social. She, oh, yeah huge part of the Washington social uh, circle. Like these mm -hmm. people were her friends, you know, and she reported on them. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing that, the thing that always connects me to the Washington Post is my dad was in the Navy. So we lived every two months, every two years we moved someplace. And so at one point we lived in Washington DC and my dad worked at the Pentagon and we moved back to California. And when we moved back to California, my parents continued to subscribe to the Washington Post. And that was before you could get anything, you know, online or that would get it overnight. So they would, there would be like a three day lag cause it was mail between when the, paper came out and when it got there. And I asked my mom one time, why do you still, you know, subscribe to that? And she said, well, because in the way it's like, it's the local Washington DC paper, like it's your hometown paper, but it's really the nation's paper. And so my, my parents felt really strongly about wanting to always feel like they were in touch with what was going on in the nation in much more detail than our San Diego paper would have had. Um, so I, I've grown up with a reverence for the Washington Post really since I was young because my parents so respected it from a journalistic perspective and what it represented. I do feel like I have to note that Richard Nixon was also the president when Title IX was signed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll, yeah. we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll give him that. <laughs> there, were things, there were good things that were done. It wasn't all yeah, that. Yes, we he had that. two daughters. <laughs> it was like the same uh, time period. And, uh, yes, yeah. If a historian was watching this, they probably would know that. So I thought it yeah. would. Yeah, yes. I, I, uh, I know we're telling, you know, stories about this, but what you talk about, he had two daughters, Peg. Um, yeah. This morning, one of my sons sent a text about, hey, you know, happy chick day, you know, that kind of thing, right? Oh, yeah. and I'm like, yeah, right. And so I took a moment and I said, let me tell you what this day means and what it's about. And so, you know, very long text. I'm sure the eyes were rolling. But, um, you know, I also said to him, and I know we talked about this on our Facebook Live last week about how, you know, in the 2018 gender global you know, the global gender equity, like the United States is not even in the top 50 when you are, right. when you weight all four of the main areas. And my sons were shocked. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, they're not. I said, and it just takes something like, you know, your, it, I said to one of my sons, it'll be your great, 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 great granddaughter before there's parity. Like there's so many, like it's, we're talking 160 plus years before there'll be, you know, gender equity. And at this his, rate. Right, at this rate. And his response was, well, I don't have to worry about that because I'm only having boys. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, yeah. And if it were up to you, okay. But, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> be prepared, gentlemen. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I have uh, one more and then Peg will end on your last. Okay, perfect. So the other one I chose uh, was I chose Catherine Hepburn. So again, we were talking about people who kind of paved the way for us personally in some way. And I sometimes choose Julia Childs as well, but I felt like I would choose Catherine Hepburn this time. And the way that they're both similar when I, when I think about Catherine Hepburn is, um, you know, she was a woman who doesn't have her own kids. She wasn't married. Um, she had a very, a way about, going about her career and her life that was very unique and just based on what she knew to do next. Um, she was great at her craft. She was very well respected in what she did, mm -hmm. uh, groundbreaking in many ways. And then also in small ways, like there are stories about, you know, before her, women couldn't really wear pants. I sort of joked earlier, we we're preparing about it, that I chose her because we get to wear pants. <laughs> like really, there were stories about how she was going set and they're like, you can't come to set in jeans. 
and she then would come to set in her underwear. <laughs> She's like, I'm wearing jeans. And that, and so then they finally let her wear her favorite pair of jeans to the set or whatever. And so I think just the way that she lived her life, managed her career, um, had her relationships, like did her thing, like there's a, I have a little admiration for what I, I don't know how it was inside her world, but just yeah. kind of the sassiness and the drive and the creativity. And, um, and then also in the work that she did, everything from, you know, things that were really funny and things that were really smart and things that were really groundbreaking and uh, everything in between and just worked her career, a long career. I mean, I still remember uh, the first time I saw On Golden Pond, you know, toward the end of her career. Yes. Um, Jane Fonda and Henry Fonda and I can hardly say the name of that movie without crying I don't know yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you know pivotal so uh, for me she just is, is a groundbreaker because of just the fact that she did her career and her life her way and there are probably many small things that have come from the choices that she made that we don't even know to thank right. her for you know because she was the first person who who did that I, well, part of what I have always appreciated by, about her is that she was such a great example of being so grounded and self-aware and willing to go out on a limb for what she believed, whatever the cost was. And she would not be, you know, stifled. You know, she just was going to speak up and do what she needed to do and make those choices that made sense for her at a time, again, when women typically didn't give themselves that permission. And so I, that for me is just like, it's so, it's so remarkable to see. And she was so respected, well respected for it. I mean, she's that great example of, you know, take a stand for yourself. And people did respect that. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other part of that, Peg, that I think I always admired about her was she was unapologetic. Yeah. So yeah. not only was she clear about what she stood for, yeah. you know, she didn't necessarily throw your face in it, rub your nose in it, but she was unapologetic about it. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I mentioned Julia Child. Some of you who watch a lot of these videos have probably heard me mention her before. I mean, the other thing I'll add about her is that she also didn't, you know, write her cookbook until she was 50. She had a cookbook wasn't, she didn't start to cook until she was like in her late forties or fifties. Right. So, you know, again, like doing what she knew to do, taking each step of her career and her life, always going for like what would be most fulfilling and then just groundbreaking as far as not really, not only cooking, but then even just being willing to try to bring, you know, French cooking to the household table of the American household. Like, who cares in a way? But we all did. I don't know. It was like one of those things. I, Absolutely. I really that as a wedding, uh, as a shower present, you know, 35 years ago. But yeah. I, I had Julia Child's kitchen, you know, that the right. And honestly, I, you know, it was one of those things where it's like, I, my attitude was, and she gave me permission not to cook. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, but well, my mother was a huge fan of hers. So we would watch Mastering the Art of French Cooking on PBS. And my mother started doing, I mean, my mother made, you know, beef burgundy, beef bourguignon from Julia Child's recipe. So there was food in my house on our table as a result of Julia Child's going out and in her own unabashed way, demonstrating how to cook on television when people weren't typically doing that. We think of the Food Network right now. The Food Network, I'm convinced, would not exist were it not for Julia Childs. Exactly. And even what we're doing yeah. right now, just like being broadcasting, talking yeah. about our work or that kind of thing. Like there was so much that just stemmed. And again, it wasn't like this strategy where she was ambitiously trying to go for a thing. She was like, well, what's the next chapter? What feels good to do next? What am I going to try? And as it expanded and more opportunities sort of came her way, she was like, okay, let's give that a shot. And also with that like healthy sense of humor and also with the support of her, you know, husband and relationships. Yes. And like yes. that. So, um, just like a couple of unique stories, again, of, of women who just continue to have a lifelong career and lifelong relationships that really kind of stood for something and were game changing and different than anything that was going on at that time and yeah. lived their lives differently than the traditional norm that was expected of them. Yeah. At that time. Yes. So yeah. I'll stop the share and then Peg, you can tell us, we don't have a picture of. Yeah. So the, the other person who came to mind was my, my first boss um, at the University of Missouri Medical Center um, when I first went into my very first professional role. 
And I was, you know, in my, I think I was 24 at the time. And I was leading a team in the hospital. Um, I probably had 50 employees and four supervisors working for me. And, you know, that was all relatively new. And my boss was a woman named Bradine Tuthill, and she was the assistant director of the department. And there were a number of things that were notable. One is that she was just such great counsel and guidance. So she, she really role modeled for me how you help somebody who's like enthusiastic and eager but doesn't know everything they need to know. You know, how do you help them navigate through all the stuff that comes up in that first job? And, you know, the, we had a, we had an, a union strike at the time. The hospital went on strike. I mean, there were so many things that I would never have ever expected or had any way of understanding how to work through those things. Um, and she was great. She didn't, it wasn't so much that she told us what to do. I was one of, you know, four peers that reported to her, but she gave great guidance and really supported us in really all leading in our own way and leading effectively. But I could always count, we called her Mrs. T. Mrs. T was always there for me. I tended to work the later shift, so she would be there at night when I would be the only one left. Um, and so I got a fair amount of just informal office time with her when things were quieting down, which was great. But the other thing that was really impactful for me is that she was um, a divorced mother um, of a son and her father lived with her. Her son was probably at that time, he might've been like about 10 years younger than me. He was in high school and I had graduated from college. Um, and what she role modeled for me and that was my first real exposure to a professional woman who was in, in some sense sort of the doing it all. She was working, she supported her family. She lived in a multi-generational um, environment at her choosing. And part of the reason her father lived with them, her father was widowed, is that she wanted her son to have a male role model in the family. And just like, there was such a thoughtful way that well, these were things that for me at 24 would not have even been things I would have thought about. Like, how, how do you do that? So she not only was a great leader and developer of leaders, um, but she was this human being who was so willing to share generously about sort of all these other aspects of what it was to be a professional woman being successful and managing all the other aspects of your life. And, and she had a full life to, to, to boot. So for me, she represented a really um, interesting inside view for me when I was a new leader coming up of what was possible. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. I loved this. This was very fun to do. It was do. fun, yeah. 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 No, I was eager to do my research assignment, which is like, <laughs> highly unusual. Yes, not always the case. Yeah, no. <laughs> the iceberg of stories out there. Yeah, so, oh my gosh, so um, many. Yeah, I'm going to, we'll share this video like we usually do. It's obviously on Facebook and our Facebook uh, video yeah. um, category. And then also on our YouTube channel, it'll be posted there. And um, it'll be part of a, a blog as well, just about how we can look for these women and other people too, who we feel like have pioneered yeah. for us uh, personally, and just the gratification and acknowledgement and motivation that comes from that. So um, look for those things so you can either watch it again or share it with others or comment, you know, share your own yeah. story and the people. Yeah, we want to hear everybody else's stories. Yeah, who should we know about? Yeah. Exactly other people that you feel like have paved the way for, for you personally for a greater uh, body of people so thank you for tuning in live or for listening later uh, anything else from the two of you that you want to say about international women's day or to close this particular conversation um, i'm glad it occurred today so it gave us an excuse to actually have this conversation yeah. so it was just really fun i'm just highly highly grateful for all of the all of the courageous people who've come before us, many of which are women and uh, many of which have been men. So, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.